The post-war fate of women who had relations with the occupiers was difficult both in the USSR and in Europe. Society often stigmatized them as traitors. Many were ostracized, humiliated, and even physically abused. In some countries they were publicly dishonored by having their heads shaved. Paradoxically, in France, a country known for its liberty and tolerance, women with ties to the occupiers were the most severely persecuted. It seems that the French, who were unable to offer significant resistance to the Wehrmacht and often collaborated with the occupiers, decided to take revenge for their humiliation on these women. Compatriots who contacted the Germans were subjected to public humiliation. They were shaved naked and driven naked through the streets for several days. Many could not withstand such treatment, resulting in mental disorders and other serious consequences. Some 18,000 women were imprisoned for up to a year and many were expelled from the country. A similar situation was observed in the Netherlands, which capitulated on the fifth day of the German invasion. There too, shaving heads, beating and abusing women with ties to the occupiers were practiced. Remarkably, no one was held accountable for these actions. So let's talk about it today. Friends, do not forget to subscribe to the channel. During World War II, there were inevitably relationships between soldiers of victorious armies and local women in occupied territories. Nazi Germany added a racial aspect to this situation, considering some peoples as fraternal Aryans. Contacts between German soldiers and women from Norway, Denmark, Belgium and the Netherlands were even encouraged. A network of Lebensborn institutions was established where women could give birth anonymously. Some 100,000 such births were recorded. The children were usually taken from their mothers and sent to Germany to be raised in Nazi ideology. Despite the strict rules, some mothers managed to keep their children. A prime example is Swedish pop star Annie Fried Lingstad of the band ABBA, whose father was German soldier Alfred Haase. Born in Norway, Annie was taken to Sweden by her mother out of fear that the child might be taken away. Raised by her grandmother after her mother's early death, Annie did not meet her father for the first time until 1977. The exact number of these children is difficult to determine, and prohibitions were often ignored due to the difficulty of wartime control and human nature. The situation varied from region to region. In France, despite its non-bloodline status by Nazi standards, some 80,000 children were born to German soldiers during the four years of occupation. Relations Relationships with Slavic women were considered particularly unacceptable because of their racial inferiority according to Nazi ideology. Wehrmacht soldiers were threatened with court-martial for having affairs with Russian women. According to German historian Regina Mühlhäuser, in 1944 alone, more than 5,000 German soldiers were convicted of such contacts. Interestingly, these strict rules did not apply to official brothels, where race was ignored. Despite strict prohibitions and severe punishments, romantic relationships between the occupiers and local women could not be prevented. Some of these relationships occurred on a voluntary basis, giving rise to stories worthy of literary works. Such cases occurred on the territory of the Soviet Union as well. One famous story is the affair between the Soviet underground fighter Maria Vasilieva and the German Oberleutnant Otto Adam. Having learned about the secret activities of her beloved, Otto did not extradite her to the Gestapo, but escaped with her to the Partisans. Their story ended tragically. Surrounded by enemies, they preferred suicide to captivity. The fate of non-commissioned officer Wilhelm Dietz is no less remarkable. Having fallen in love with the nurse Fenny Ostrich, who took care of him in the hospital, he deserted from the German army. Wilhelm hid in the attic of Fanny's house until the end of the war, during which time he became fluent in Russian. Under the name Vasily Dotsenko, he lived in the USSR until the late 1980s, starting a family with Fenny and becoming a grandfather. Only during the perestroika years did he reveal his real identity and even visited Germany, where he found relatives. Although romantic stories between occupants and local women attract attention, they were the exception rather than the rule. In most cases, relationships were based on pragmatic calculation or fear rather than love. The occupiers satisfied their desires and the women received some protection, patronage and material goods, food, money and clothing. 
these relationships sometimes took unexpected forms. For example, Spanish soldiers from the Blue Division stationed near Novgorod married local women in Russian churches. They plundered neighboring villages giving their girlfriends stolen livestock and belongings. The farther away from Berlin, the less strictly the official prohibitions on such liaisons were observed. Officers often turned a blind eye to such relationships, especially given the scarcity of official brothels in the rear areas. In some places, the occupation authorities even began paying Russian mothers alimony on behalf of the Wehrmacht, two or three hundred rubles a month. Although the amount was small, the very fact of such payments is remarkable. After the collapse of the Third Reich, women who had ties to the occupiers found themselves in a vulnerable position. Attitudes toward them varied depending on the country and zone of occupation, although they were generally negative. The Americans and British were the most lenient. Not faced with the problem of occupying their own territories, they showed less interest in the moral issues of other nations. In their zones, they limited themselves to registering German cohabitants as prostitutes and then leaving them alone. In the liberated areas of the Soviet Union, the situation was more complicated. Women who entered into relationships with Germans were negatively stigmatized for years. Although there were rare cases of being sent to camps for collaboration with the occupiers, most avoided serious persecution. They were not categorized as criminals and were not specifically sought out. Interestingly, the attitude of the local population was often more understanding than the official position. Neighbors tended to treat these women with sympathy, understanding the difficulty of their situation during the occupation, and what about Norway? Although the Nazis considered the Norwegians a brotherly people, the Norwegians themselves did not, for the most part, support the occupation. Only about 10% of the population collaborated with the invaders, while the resistance movement was active. After the liberation of the country, most collaborators were prosecuted. Women who had links with the occupiers were also persecuted. 14,000 were arrested on charges of cohabitation with Germans, of whom 5,000 were sent to labor camps for a year and a half. Their children were taken away and placed in special orphanages, branding them offspring of Germans. The process of rehabilitation of these women and their children did not begin until 35 years after the war in the early 1980s. However, it was not until 2005 that the Norwegian government officially recognized the repression as a mistake and paid the victims symbolic compensation of 3,000 euros each. Friends, this is how the video turned out and what you think about it, write in the comments.